In order to improve inclusive economic growth in Africa, and more particularly Nigeria, the African International Conference on Islamic Finance hosted its fifth edition, which discussed the theme Infrastructure Financing, Sustainability, and the Future of Africa Market 2.0. The two-day conference brought together key stakeholders, industry leaders, royal fathers, head of key institutions and policy makers both in Africa and across the globe. Giving a welcome address, the chairperson of the conference, Mrs. Umahani Ahmad Amin, gave an overview of this year's conference and announced the launch the Metropolitan WAF. The fourth um, ICF, which was held in 2019, um, in Lagos, the, the theme was infrastructure, financing, sustainability, and the future of African markets. And then after that came COVID. Nigeria hasn't really moved from what um, they require when it comes to infrastructure, financing. We're still where we are. There's still that deficit in, in, in the financing of um, projects and infrastructure in Nigeria. So um, we thought that um, this is a problem we have and why I save in the first place is for us to be able to come and um, talk about what our problems are and how we can solve them. So if we were not able to solve that problem in 2019, we have to come again this year to, say, to, to have the same theme and discuss the same um, issue and see how we can be able to um, take advantage of um, Islamic finance uh, structures. In his keynote address, the 14th Emir of Kano and former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, His Royal Highness Muhammadu Sanusi II, acknowledged that Sub-Saharan Africa is facing a colossal infrastructure financing deficit which Islamic finance can be deployed to address. An essential condition for the development of Islamic finance markets is the presence of an effective legal and regulatory framework to provide an enabling environment that will create a level playing field and enforce the legality of Islamic finance contracts and ensure Sharia compliance. Regulators, especially in the banking, capital markets and insurance, have been quite responsive to this development through creating the enabling environment facilitating its integration into the mainstream financial sector and generating awareness to achieve a higher level of its acceptance and thus a higher level of financial inclusion. Going forward, there's a need for more collaboration between regulatory authorities to grow the industry, as well as more awareness generation and more professional development for effective and efficient operation of the institutions in order to instill and maintain stakeholder confidence and achieve optimal performance. This forum is one such initiative for achieving the needed collaboration and awareness generation. We hope that the convenience will continue with this. In addition, the central bank as a pace setter needs to continue with this initiative of developing non-interest stability management instruments, particularly short-term papers for non-interest banks. Without these in the market, the possibility for creating a non-interest interbank market is very slim, and this will impact negatively on the profitability of the institutions. Despite the potential for growth of the Islamic financial services industry in Africa, promoters need to be encouraged to establish more Islamic financial institutions so as to create the needed critical mass that is essential for the growth of the industry in the continent and these institutions need to come together to support each other for advocacy and growth of the industry. The keynote speaker, Dr. Mansu Mutar, Vice President, Country Operations for the Islamic Development Bank, shared the role Islamic finance can play in mobilizing funds for sustainable infrastructure, financial inclusion, and diversify financial products. I would focus my keynote address on this theme from the perspective of Islamic finance while taking advantage of the opportunity to also share with you the experience of Islamic Development Bank in this area. I believe 
that this is a very timely and pertinent event, coming at a time when the world is still tackling the grave effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the context of significant developments that have shaped the global socioeconomic and political environment in the last decade, I believe the time is ripe to push forward with a refreshed outlook and renewed resolve on the future path of, for infrastructure financing in Africa. While the socioeconomic conditions facing Africa today may appear to be a confluence of many multifaceted structural problems, let me reassure you that their root cause sees are only a few in number, and chief among these is the lack of economic diversification. I also posit that in order to diversify African economies, we need to finance sustainable and resilient infrastructure that would facilitate a clear shift from commodities reliance. The sustainability of infrastructure cannot be attained, of course, in isolation of the need to protect the environment from the effects of climate change and ensuring the social development of its users. Islamic finance, again, in its true spirit, adheres to the principle of protecting the environment and promoting judicial use of resources without waste. These principles are translated into social and environmental aspects which must be integrated in project design and converted into related financial products. For instance, the Islamic Development Bank issued its inaugural AAA rated green spook to the tune of 1 billion euros in 2019 and its debut 1.5 billion US dollar sustainability scoop in 2020, which has been followed up by $2.5 billion sustainability scoop in 2021. There are huge opportunities for African governments to deploy these mechanisms for financing sustainable infrastructure and tapping the niche investors in this space. And the importance of Islamic finance in unlocking multiple bottlenecks across Africa in infrastructure financing cannot be overstated. One of the key features of Islamic finance that is of paramount importance within the current context of ensuring sustainable infrastructure financing is the underlying principle of risk sharing. Risk sharing and equity participation as central tenets of the design of Islamic financial products promote the inherent stake of the financier in the sustainability and resilience of the infrastructure built with the financing. This is the crucial difference between conventional financial products and Islamic financial products that cannot be reiterated enough. Uh, distinguished participants, Islamic finance bears strong potential to support financial deepening and financial diversification in Africa and to facilitate a conducive environment for catalyzing private sector infrastructure financing. Catalyzing private sector infrastructure financing will in turn alleviate the debt burden and tight fiscal spaces of African nations and free up resources to be directed towards physical and social infrastructure development that are much needed to address the adverse socioeconomic ramifications of the pandemic, increased extreme poverty, and widening inequalities. Before closing my remarks, I would like to seize the opportunity to reiterate that the Islamic Development Bank Group stands committed with its laser focus on serving its member countries' needs, and we have 57 member countries, including 23 in Africa and across the continent, including Suriname, Guyana, and several other countries. We pledge to work hand in hand with stakeholders to create a new era of African prosperity in this decade of action. Day one of the conference feature the panel sessions with the keynote speakers and other plenary sessions. I think this is a very, very timely conversation. Basically because it is more than just infrastructure that's important. We are not limiting infrastructure, but I'm saying it's very important for us to begin to focus on the intangible. Those and uh, investing in humans trying to see how we can support people that are poor, that are needy, to be able to get to a level where we can close the disparities 
opportunities abound, but many of these opportunities are not available to people who cannot engage with them. One of the things I would suggest for organizations that are interested in going into education is to identify who's already doing what. But also, you can't solve every problem. But the reason why I'm mentioning Almateries is because if you were to help me with your work money go for a PhD, it wouldn't really, it would probably increase some of the quality of the work I do, but it wouldn't create any jobs, not significantly. With the same amount of money, you could take over 40, we are able to do a training for 50 Almageries over six months with six million naira, plus feeding, plus transport, plus a per diem to allow them to focus on studies. If you were to spend the same amount of money on Almagery children to build their capacity to do some vocational work. If you've trained this person to be a tailor or a carpenter or a mobile phone repairer or you know, clothes designer or somebody who does aluminium work and all sorts of, we've got up to I think about 28 different vocational skills that you can take them through. If they learn to be a carpenter and you give them capital to go and start on their own, they can't work alone. By definition, a carpenter needs somebody to help him hold the wood. He already creates a job. The moment you produce a mechanic, he can't work alone. He already needs an apprentice. He already creates a job and becomes an educational system himself. So I think if we can focus on that demographic, they are the most left behind. They are the ones who build all the schools you want. Um, for many reasons, they will not join. So I think if more can target on that group, it will create jobs for them and they will create jobs for their own colleagues. So I think it's the fastest way of getting at least the very bottom of the pyramid of that. Also, in her remarks at the conference, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Mrs. Zainab Ahmed, said the federal government has given top priority to Islamic finance and will continue to explore different financing options as public-private partnership to support innovative finance and Islamic finance will play an important role. One of the options that we took very early on was the introduction of an Islamic instrument for infrastructure finance and support point. As we speak, we just launched the fourth circle of the support point. We have had four so far. The first two were 100 billion each. The third one was 162 billion. And this one that we just launched uh, a week ago is 250 billion. These are um, instruments of finances specific road infrastructure across the six political zones of the country. They are an investment finance, they are interest free, and they have proven to be extremely popular. Because every time we go out to the market, the subscription is more than 300% oversubscribed. So it shows to us that the appetite is there. And also, we're looking at the industry and at this conference to suggest to us other instruments that we will uh, need to introduce to enhance the efforts of mobilizing resources through non-interest learning finance. On the second and final day of the conference, the keynote speaker from the capital market, Mr. Ibrahim Boyi, Executive Commissioner, Securities and Action Commission of Nigeria, who represented the Director General, said SEC is still committed to facilitating the growth of the non-interest capital markets. It was also an opportunity to deepen the conversation further with the keynote speaker on current market trends and other topical issues relevant to the growth of Islamic finance. The SEC remains supportive of initiatives such as this, especially given that they provide a platform for exchange of ideas on an issue that is of critical importance to our nation. As part of our developmental role, 
The SEC will continue to encourage corporates to leverage on the Islamic capital market by providing and ensuring an attractive enabling environment. The Commission is working assiduously with relevant stakeholders to implement recommendations for the non-interest capital market sector in line with the objectives of the 10-year Nigerian Capital Market Master Plan 2015 to 2025, which include developing the segment of the market to contribute at least 25% of the overall capital capital market capitalization in 2025, with SCOOP contributing 15% of the outstanding bond issuers. The conference featured special presentations, question and answer session, three plenary sessions and closing remarks by the chairperson of the 5th AICIF conference. Mrs. Umahani Ahmad Amin, chairperson for the 5th AICIF, His Royal Highness Mohammed Sanasi II, the Finance Minister, Mrs. Zainab Ahmed, and other dignitaries share their perspective on the theme Infrastructure Financing, Sustainability, and the Future of Africa Market 2.0. Islamic financing instrument, like any other financing instrument, to raise resources. The difference is it's not interest uh, earning. It is, in, uh, in most cases, an equity contribution. And that's a viable option that some people really like. So uh, our hope, at least as federal government, is we've just opened uh, another round of Sukuk bonds to raise 250 billion uh, naira. And we're expecting that, that uh, this offering will be uptaken completely, in fact, oversubscribed. Well, you know, this is the second edition of the conference on the same theme. Uh, and we've come a long way since the last one. Uh, even in Nigeria, we've had a number of Sukuk issuances. And then you've had countries like Gambia and Cote d'Ivoire and Senegal, uh, which have come up and issued Sukuk. We've had South Africa now issue a dollar denominated Sukuk. Uh, so uh, clearly, the continent has caught on to Islamic finance as an alternative form for financing infrastructure. Uh, we will just look forward to more and more regular Sukuk issuances across different dispensations so that we can have proper yield curves and move beyond sovereign to subnational level and to corporate Sukuk. Islamic finance is based on Sharia and Sharia goes beyond the Sharia that we know today. Right from when Allah SWT uh, you know, created his creations, he sends them rules on how you do and how you don't, what you should and what you should not do. So that's why it's an old game, because it's the same Sharia that came from in the beginning of time to date. You know, but there are um, new innovations uh, today, because based on the provisions of the Quran and the Sunnah, then you have uh, you know, other concepts, you know, that, um, for example, that came in due to either Ijtima of the ulama or some analogy of the ulama, and they came up with um, sort of rulings that guide how we do things in modern times. There are lots of developments that we have seen um, in, um, um, in finance generally, conventional. Now, how do we take those developments in conventional finance into Islamic finance? So we have to interpret the laws, understand them, and then interpret what the Quran and Sunnah are saying in order to find a way on how Islamic finance can ride on those developments to also prosper. We need to be aware um, and understand what Islamic finance is, especially for those, uh, those non-Muslims who feel that it's only for Muslims. So we need to make each other understand, and even for the Muslims, they need to understand that Islamic finance is not... Um, an Islamic personal law. It is an Islamic way of transaction. The Prophet وسلم, transacted with people that were not Muslims from the status. So um, we are trying to tell everybody that whether you're Muslim or not, you can be able to leverage on that. And until Nigeria understands that this is not for us alone, then we are in a better place and people can leverage on that. I was at a conference and we were talking about um, different areas that people, um, legal practitioners, will leverage on. 
once they said Umuhani talk about Islamic finance, um, some people just walked away because they don't want that word Islamic. You, you understand? So that's why I said it's the one, two, and three uh, yes, tropical issue. Why, first of all, we need to understand Islamic finance. So true awareness and for the, the practitioners in the industry to be able to bring out um, you know, products and be disruptive and say, okay, we want to do this this way, we want to do this, provided it's Sharia compliant. So these are some of the tropical issues that affect Islamic finance. And then a lot of liquidity with no instruments to go into. And we agreed that we are going to empower people, you know, young people, educate them through, through the work. We will bring them together, empower them through vocational trainings. And then so, because if you have one carpenter, he will need somebody to hold the wood. And then so he has empowered that person. If you have a mechanic, he will need someone to hold the tire for him to be able to put things together or paint the car and all that. He has empowered those people. So this is how we want to um, take advantage of the work. And we want everybody in Nigeria who yes to be part of. So we will open the fund for anyone. You can be able to invest one naira or 100 million naira. Everybody that wants to do charity, honestly, can be involved in it. And we will, of course, be very transparent. We will show what we have done, and everyone will see the results. Like I said, the next ICIV, we are going to showcase what we have done with that work. With Africa facing an infrastructure financing gap of $360 billion, the role of alternative finance, also known as Islamic finance or non-interest finance, in mobilizing financing for sustainability infrastructure cannot be overemphasized. This shows that innovative Islamic financial products and services will improve trade, social development, physical infrastructure, deepen financial inclusion, and improve industrialization. A major takeaway from the 5th African International Conference on Islamic Finance is the need for synergy amongst operators in the Islamic finance markets and an improved regulatory environment. This will deepen awareness and unlock more opportunities that will lead to inclusive economic growth in Nigeria and Africa.